down. I, I like that. A little, a little, uh, little hotter. There we go. Because that, that way, that way, I can seem like I'm really nice and and compassionate and <laughs> sensitive, and they can still hear me. As I, I've got this tendency as I, as I start talking louder and louder, I get more aggressive, and I don't want to scare anybody. Okay, how are we doing here? How are we doing? It's uh, uh, I want I want to get started a little bit uh, on time, like today, uh, mainly because it's <clears throat> it's kind of to to have only one class period to talk about the Fourth Amendment uh, and the rights to privacy and stuff is uh, is kind of discomforting. Uh, uh, there there are whole uh, classes. You know, entire courses taught on the Fourth Amendment, and so I, I want you to keep that in mind as we're going through this, and uh, and make make some notes uh, as you're as we're going along for things that you can ask about on Thursday. You know, in our discussion session, because uh, both today and then uh, on Thursday, going through the due process uh, rights, the uh, un uh, oops, great. The, uh, the unenumerated rights, uh, we're, going to, we're, we're going to have to move fairly quickly. And uh, I, want, I want the questions you know, sort of directed toward that Thursday. But I want to, I want to give you some good news here that what, what, I'm, what I'm planning to do is I'm planning to move the date, the due date for the second essay to move it to the following week. Okay, so you're, you're going to get a whole extra week on, on that thing. Instead of having it due on, the, on May 12th, Tuesday, May 12th, that it won't be due until Tuesday, May 19th. Uh, in that way, we'll get a little more time to talk about these specific uh, unenumerated rights uh, that, that fall under the rubric of both the, the Due Process Clause and the Ninth Amendment. Because I, I found myself in trying to figure out how to squeeze all of that in to just uh, Thursday, uh, that it, was, it wasn't going to uh, give it the kind of uh, time and attention that it merited. So I want to have it go over to the next week to be able to talk about those things. And, uh, and yeah, I want you to have the whole weekend uh, before the essay is due to get to work on it. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to move it to the following Tuesday on, uh, on May 19th, okay? Uh, you don't have to tell anybody who isn't here on time uh, so they can rush and get their, their thing done. <clears throat> but, okay, so, uh, so now, the, uh, as you know, and I, I, I kind of reiterated at the beginning of each class because I always, I always want you to be holding in mind the kind of the superstructure within which we're working so that as we're directing our conversations to a particular subject during a particular class period, you have a, a refreshed instinct as to what the context is in which this is happening. So that you can you know, think of questions that relate it to the, to the superstructure of the Constitution and of the course and of the overall mission that we have here of attempting to prepare you to be familiar and fluent with aspects of the Constitution to be used to address this major crisis that I'm talking about that is going to be coming. And we're going to be devoting the whole uh, third part of the course to this. Now, I had, uh, I had hoped, and we're close to it, right, we're right within a couple lectures, uh, I was going to have the whole first half of the course devoted to preparing you. Uh, for the, the half course long discussion of the actual application of these, these rights and concepts to this whole issue of the crisis that's going to be coming and how you're going to deal with that. Uh, so but we're, we're, gonna, we're only going to be one uh, or two class periods behind that. Uh, and and uh, so, so what I'm doing is we're we're still doing part two of the three parts of the course, and we're in section B dealing with the amendments, the specific amendments and the specific rights as distinct from part A, 
which is the, the three articles of the separation of powers, the specific uh, concepts that are involved in the, uh, the affirmative construction of the Constitution itself. Uh, and, and as you know, part three is going to be directed to the secret government, uh, our Constitution in crisis, uh, and in describing exactly what the nature of that problem is. <coughs> Uh, so with, with, with that in mind, I'm going to, uh, I didn't, uh, I, I guess I didn't put the sheet back in here of what the readings are, that, uh, that little sheet that had all the readings on it. But the, the, bo the bottom line is, is that, that you guys have got it now. Uh, Toby sent out to you this morning a set of uh, supplemental readings that I want you to do. In light of the fact that we're moving the due date of the essay, uh, I want you to, to use the time that you're being given, uh, extra time, to do some additional readings. They're going to help you uh, have resources and tools with which to do your essay. Okay, And there, there are about uh, four or five uh, articles, some as short as three pages long, uh, a few of them like eight or nine pages long, uh, that I want you to take a look at that actually address specific entire concepts, like the concept of what we call selective inclusion. Uh, and I'll, I'll address that more on, uh, on Thursday when we start talking about the due process clause, the process by means of which specific enumerated rights in the Constitution that applied against the federal government were imported by the Supreme Court into the Due Process Clause to be enforceable against the states uh, uh, as, as, a, as a requirement to be imposed upon the states. I don't mean to be interrupting you guys. Excuse me? Okay, come on. Please pay attention here. All right? <laughs> it's okay. But, uh, yes? Sure. It's 15 pages. Yes, yes. No, no, we can do that. Now, did, did you, you got the, the prompt on the second, the second uh, essay, the one that you're working on now. Uh, and then I'll just direct some attention. Toby and I have some conversations, and I'll talk with some of the other students that come in on Wednesdays for, uh, for office hours and stuff, and I'll get that, I'll get that figured out. Okay? Uh, okay, so that there's, there's, as I say, there's a, there's a, a, a few extra readings. Uh, and there's some cases that there have been a couple of people that have raised the, the question about, you know, why aren't we reading more cases and having specific discussions of cases uh, here, uh, that this seems to be quite philosophical and kind of abstract, a lot of these discussions. Uh, and it's because I'm trying to get you to, to, be, to have an instinctive sense, a philosophical sense of what the what is going on here because you know in in the law school they will they will draw you way down into the weeds on these particular rights and particular decisions that are being made with regard to the rights and you miss the the configuration of the entire forest what what I'm what I'm doing here is I'm talking about these specific rights the enumerated rights first in the context of this this contest that is going on that I've talked with you about, this contest uh, where the authoritarian uh, right systematists had the day for hundreds of years in Western civilization where there was this authoritarian position taken by the, uh, the royalty uh, and the ecclesial uh, allies of the royalists uh, that, that didn't acknowledge the possession of any rights on the part of, uh, of the people. And that there is then, there and after, after the establishment of the Constitution, there were a whole group of these, as we refer to them, these sixth paradigm natural law advocates, such as Madison and Jefferson, that basically responded to that, those, those uh, centuries of, uh, of authoritarian domination with the articulation of kind of an ideal set of rights and principles that were possessed as a matter of natural law 
by we citizens over and against the, the government. And then we have the reactionaries, the Hamiltonians and the Adamses, for example, that were attempting to salvage a large uh, number of the qualities of an authoritarian system and to draw it ba those back into application, uh, even under the Constitution. Okay, so that this fundamental dialogue or dialectical dynamic that was going on between the reactionaries and the adherence to the natural law uh, theory of justice end up getting uh, moderated or mediated, if you will, uh, by the middle marginalists, by the moderates. Uh, and that that's, that's the context in which I want you to to not only think about these rights that we're talking about, but to develop a set of kind of basic instincts with regard to these rights so that you can fully anticipate, in effect, you know, once, once you know what the authoritarian position was on these rights, which we touch upon at the opening of the discussion of each one of these enumerated rights, we'll talk about the history uh, in Europe that led to uh, these instincts that the natural law adherents had. Uh, in the, what, what, I, what I want you to do is think in these terms constantly of the, the, the post-constitution re resultant dialectic between the reactionaries and the natural law adherents, knowing that the resolution is probably going to get made by the moderates or the middle marginalists. Okay, so it, it sounds like a peculiar kind of analysis, but my experience after 45 years of dealing with these rights uh, is that this is the operational dynamic in which if you understand it and become uh, facile at using it, uh, you'll, you'll know what's going on. Okay, and so that there, there'll be a number of those cases that I've, uh, we've set out for you uh, at, the top of, at the top of your email today, you'll see it. There are sp a specific handful of cases that I want you to actually get a chance to read because some of you have raised this concern that this is over-philosophical. Now, I, I assume that that's being raised by the people who aren't philosophy majors uh, here. But, but since 50 out of the 68 of you are philosophy majors, uh, uh, I've, I've leaned in this direction, uh, but, I, but we do want to accommodate uh, some of the other people who would, would like to see some cases and see how we discuss these cases and, and, and how they come to life. I found, I found all of law school to be an absolutely fabulous experience because all you have to do is sit down and read the case and then you make a couple little notes and it's just like remembering a movie, you know. I mean, the, 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 the case plays itself out in your mind's eye, and you can see a videotape of the characters and who the plaintiff was. And once you become fluent in these basic concepts like who's the plaintiff, who's the one making the complaint in a civil case, what's the particular form of relief that uh, they're asking for, you know, what was the tribunal before which they appeared seeking this relief, and then what was the controlling aspect of the opinion or ruling that was made? Uh, and were there any dissents that objected to that? And what was their line of reasoning? These are, these are the, the conceptual tools that you would develop if you were actually going to deal with these things professionally. But you saw last week in the, the Thursday uh, section in which we started discussing some of the specific aspects of free expression that you could see right within a matter of minutes how interesting it gets. You know, how, how uh, kind of stimulated you can get about trying to think of particular ways in which these issues would come into play. And uh, that occurs with regard to all of these things. Now, I don't, I don't have that experience when you're talking about contract law or business law or other commercial law because I'm not that interested in the, uh, you know that. Uh, but in this particular case, I think that these particular rights uh, are interesting to basically everybody. Now the more upset you are about arbitrary and capricious actions on the part of the government, 
the more excited you get about these things because you actually have some kind of a sense of their, their need of really wanting to have these things. Uh, okay, so that it, with all of that having been said, what I want to do, I want to today, I want to turn to the Fourth Amendment. Now, the, the Fourth Amendment uh, to the United States Constitution, it, you remember now the First Amendment is freedom of expression in all of the interrelated aspects of expression, freedom of thought, freedom of belief, freedom of religious belief, freedom of religious practice, uh, you know, uh, free press. All of these are a constellation of rights that kind of emanate from the concept of free speech and free expression. Uh, and then you get your, your Second Amendment, which we aren't going into a lot of time on, which is the one of the alleged right to bear arms, uh, that a well-regulated militia being necessary for the defense of the, of the uh, country that, uh, that uh, no law shall be passed restricting a citizen's right to bear arms. Uh, that we can spend a whole lot of time on that, but I'm, I'm not sure there's that many survivalists here uh, in the course that are that interested in that one. Uh, so we move quickly to the Third Amendment, which specifically simply states that, that the, there'll be no quartering of troops in anybody's private home without having some sort of law passed that regulates that and sets up the standards for when that can be done. Uh, and so that that begins to open onto the question of the, the sort of the sanctity of the privacy of one's own home, the right not to have the state, in that particular case the king, be able to just issue an edict that there's going to be, you know, 10 soldiers living in your house with you uh, for as long as the king wanted them to be there. Uh, one kind of immediately recoils at the whole prospect of that. Uh, uh, but it was set forth in the Third Amendment explicitly because of the practice that the British had of quartering troops in people's houses involuntarily. So it begins to open on to the basic concept of the, the sanctity of the privacy of your own home, the right to be in charge of what goes on inside your home, uh, and not allow the state to intrude inside your home. Uh, but then it opens quickly onto the Fourth Amendment. And the Fourth Amendment is, is, a, is a simple one, at least on the face of it, and it says simply, it says, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated. And so, no warrant shall issue, but upon the demonstration of probable cause supported by a sworn oath affidavit particularly describing the person or things that are to be searched for and authorized to be seized. Okay? So now, right away, right away when you, when you read that, you kind of get this vision uh, of the cops coming to the door and uh, saying that they want to come in and search your house, and you've heard probably at least a hundred times in your life, uh, someone saying, oh yeah, have you got a warrant? You know, pro probably one of the more interesting uh, experiences of that was when, uh, uh, how, many, how many of you here have heard about the Attica prison riots? Yeah, the long time learners. Okay, what, what, what happened, what happened, back, what happened back in 1971 at Attica prison, which is a state prison, maximum security prison in New York State, uh, out by Buffalo, uh, there was a riot that took place. Uh, and the prisoners uh, seized the, the, the prison and they took 41 hostages uh, of various civilians that were working in the prison at the time. And this riot broke out. I get a call. Uh, I'm working at the Cahill Gordon firm, this big, you know, 176 trial lawyers down on Wall Street uh, where I'd gone to to work on the case uh, establishing the right of journalists to protect their confidential news sources, the In Ray Pappas case and the Earl Caldwell case. Uh, and this was 
prior to us getting the Pentagon Papers case that kind of took our full-time focus there for 13 days. But in between those two briefings, uh, I get a call from Bill Kunstler, who was a very well-known uh, people's lawyer at the time. And uh, I had heard on the television uh, about this riot that had taken place up at uh, Attica Prison in New York. And since I was a member of the Bar of New York, uh, and my father had been a prison guard, uh, actually, and uh, I had been appointed by Mayor John Lindsay, the mayor of New York City, to be the lawyer for all of the inmates in the Manhattan House of Correction, uh, and had been doing that for some months by that time, that Bill Kunstler called me and asked if I would fly up to Buffalo, New York, to make the argument in front of the federal district court for the Western District of New York in front of Judge Curtin uh, asking to have an emergency order signed by the federal court ordering lawyers into the prison because we were concerned that the New York State Police and the New York State National Guard that had been mobilized by the governor, Rockefeller, uh, we're going to be attacking the prison militarily and that we wanted to have lawyers in the prison to prevent, you know, uh, un, unwarranted uh, deaths. <clears throat> and so I, I flew up. I went and saw Floyd Abrams, my supervising attorney, and he said that it was okay. Uh, uh, actually, I didn't find him. I left a note on his desk uh, asking him if it was okay. And there's an old doctrine at law that it's always easier to get uh, forgiveness than permission. Uh, and so, so I left a note for him. And uh, I went to see Gene Scheiman, who was the associate, the number two under Floyd. I was the number three at the firm on the First Amendment law for the New York Times and NBC and all those. So I went to see Gene Scheiman, who was the president of the Brooklyn Law, law School Law Review. Uh, and so I went to see him and told him, uh, he was an associate uh, there at the firm, told him that I'd just been asked by Bill Kunstler to go up to Buffalo to uh, appear uh, and represent the inmates uh, to get this uh, order, and uh, told him that I was leaving. And I, I went uh, back to my office and got in the elevator, uh, pushed the button and opened up the door of the elevator, and there's Gene Scheiman uh, standing in the elevator with a bag packed, uh, ready to go and asked as if, I could, if he could go with me. So I said, sure, come on. So we come down, we go out to the airport, uh, to, to uh, JFK, and we flew up to Boston. And we go to the University of Buffalo, uh, and there's all the defense lawyers all gathered around. There are about eight or 10 of them there, uh, prepared to go into the prison if we can get the order. So uh, I went into the, to the court the following morning and made the argument to Judge Curtin to uh, interpose the, the uh, lawyers uh, into the prison to stop this attack from taking place. And Judge Curtin had it under consideration later on that day uh, when we got word that the, uh, that the National Guard uh, and the New York State Police were moving against the prison. So we called out to Judge Curtin's home outside of, of Buffalo and we went out to his house and we were actually at his house in the kitchen with him in his pajamas and his, his, uh, his robe uh, arguing to him about why it is that he had to sign the order right now to, so we could get into the prison. And so uh, he, he called on the telephone, called the U.S. attorney, got him out of bed and put him on the phone and let him argue his case and then signed the order. And... Uh, and uh, we, we actually put into the court order a prohibition against any of the New York State Police or the National Guard interfering with our First Amendment right to travel on the highway, uh, and, uh, which was a, a piece that used to get put in the, the federal court orders down south when the uh, federal attorney, the attorneys were working on civil rights cases to stop the police from harassing them on the, on the highways. And so we put this together and we get in the, we go out and we get in the uh, caravan. We had uh, two Volkswagen camper buses uh, in the lead and we had like uh, four or five other cars behind us with the lawyers in them. And we go out to the uh, New York State Thruway 
and we come to the throughway booth, and there were na armed National Guardsmen uh, at the booth, and they'd shut off the highways. Uh, they'd shut off the New York State Thruway and the highways out through there. And uh, there were uh, big military vehicles everywhere, uh, U.S. Army uh, vehicles with, uh, with <coughs> fully armed National Guards guys everywhere all around with machine guns. And we come up to the, we come up to the uh, turnpike and we showed them the federal court order. And uh, the, the commanding officer that was there he tried to take the court order and take it away from us. And uh, we said, no, no, uh, th this is the court order. We have the right to, to go in. Uh, and if you try to obstruct us, you're going to be in contempt of court. <clears throat> and so they stood out of the way, and we went in through the gate. We were going down the highway, and it was, it was like misting out. It was getting on. It was dark by this time. And uh, we were, were going along the New York State Highway, and uh, we're, we get about uh, two or three miles down the road, and uh, eight uh, New York State police cars come screaming up behind us with the red lights and sirens going, and uh, they force us off the road. They're in this big caravan, and they start forcing our caravan of cars off the, the New York State Thruway. So we pull off the side of the road, and uh, they all jump out with, uh, with, with armed, uh, armed in these riot gears with all the big helmets on and the big you know, plastic face masks and everything. And they climb out and they start uh, and uh, they, they come over and I was in the lead car as the lead attorney. And they come over and they actually pulled out tire gauges the depth for the, measuring the depth of tire treads and started measuring the depths of the tire treads on the cars to see if they could uh, take and pound the car as having inadequate uh, tires. Uh, for the rainy weather, and uh, and so I was, uh, I walked over to the guy, and I had the the federal court order in my hand, and I leaned down in front of him, uh, and we and uh, shone a flashlight on the federal court order, and I said to him, I said, you see that paragraph right there about not being allowed to interfere with us on the federal on the highways, uh, that means you, you know. And that means uh, you're going to go to federal prison in about 30 seconds if you don't get away from us and let us get back on the highway. And so he rises up like this, and he gives me this kind of really ominous, nasty look. Uh, and then I said to him, I said, I want to talk to your barracks commander. It was totally bizarre because I hadn't thought about barracks commanders for years. But since my father was a New York State prison guard, and knew all the state police in New York, I knew that the guy that was in charge of this thing had to be the barracks commander. So I said, I want to talk to your barracks commander. In the instant that I said that, this freeze frame went over all of the cops. Every one of them just froze right in place like that, having heard that, because they knew that I knew what I was talking about. And so the guy that was standing next to me, the, the barracks commander comes over to me. And just as he was approaching me, I turned and I looked, and there, there was, uh, there was a, a huge uh, New York State police officer walking up to the second uh, Volkswagen bus. And uh, Gene Scheinman was sitting in the passenger seat of the, of the bus. And uh, the, guy, the guy came up and he pounded on the window like that. And Gene rolled the window down about two inches and uh, said, yes, can I help you, officer? And the officer looked at me and he says, hey, look at... Uh, uh, how about I take a little look around in here? And he starts to move to open up the door to the, to the Volkswagen bus. And Gene Scheinman, being kind of initially totally intimidated, as anybody would be, he said, well, uh, yes, yes, I guess so. And as the guy reached for the door, Gene said, that is if you have a warrant. And the guy who had his hand on the door takes his hand off the door and comes back over and leans in the window and says, so it's going to be like that, is it? That's what he said to him. And he... Took his, he took his gun out like this and cocked the shotgun like this. And uh, it started leaning over toward him like this. And just as I saw that, I, I, I grabbed the barracks commander and I said, well, officer, I said, what seems to be the problem over here? And I could go walking over to him. And, uh, and we showed him the warrant, or we showed him our federal court order, stood them all down, and we actually were allowed to get back up on the highway and drove all the way out to the prison where the helicopter that dropped all the tear gas into the, into the yard was turned over on its side and had crashed. And, uh, you know, and that, uh, it turns out that they'd already attacked the prison. 
by the time we got there and had killed all 41 of the hostages and actually uh, issued an official New York State coroner's report stating that every one of the 41 hostages had died by having their throats cut by the inmates. And so we staked out the prison, putting guys at each one of the doors. And, uh, and uh, I went up to the front steps and knocked the door, and, and they opened up the little slot in the door, and I put through it a copy of the federal court order we had. I said, this is a federal court order from Judge Tom Curtin uh, ordering us into the prison. And he took the order, and he slammed the door shut, and he comes back in about three minutes, and he pushed it back out to me, and he says, Court order or no court order, you ain't coming in. He said, we have a state of emergency in here. And I said, this is a federal court order, and you're in defiance of the court order. And the guy you know, looked through the window and said, fuck you, he said. And I said, so he closed the door like that. And I was standing there kind of, kind of in that early age, kind of thunderstruck, you know, at the balls of this guy to have said something like that to me with a federal court order in my hand. And, uh, and uh, this great, they, they had these two great big goons standing, on the, standing at, at the, on the front steps, you know, these big orange, bright orange fluorescent uh, uh, rain slickers, you know, with shotguns and stuff. And the guy came over to me and he said, you heard him, asshole. He says, and I look at him like this, and he just clobbered me with the, with the butt end of his shotgun like that and you know, kind of hit me right across the side of the neck like that and knocked me down. And so I jumped right back up immediately, trying to reflect upon exactly what I was going to do to him. And uh, <laughs> at, 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 at which point, uh, Herman Schwartz, Herman Schwartz, who was the head of the ACLU for the Western region of New York, who was there with me, you know, he grabbed me by the arm. And he says, no, no, Danny, don't. Don't do that. And uh, I said, OK, Herman. I said, you're going to go call Judge Curtin right now. And you're going to have him, you know, nationalize the National Guard and order them to retake this prison by military force. And he looked at me and he said, holy shit, Danny, he said like that. And I said, that was a bad one of my, my worst lines, but I said, uh, Herman, you're in the big time now. That's what I said to him. I shouldn't have said that. But anyway, that's, that's what I said to him. And he said, I'll do it. And he turns around, walks down off the steps, and went looking all over, and they wouldn't let him use a telephone anywhere. Anywhere around the prison, wouldn't let him use a telephone. It was all pre-cell phone days. So he goes back out and has to go all the way back to the, phone, to the booth of the New York State highway, uh, the highway and called Judge Curtin, told him that they were in defiance of the court order, and uh, he declined to nationalize the, the uh, National Guard but said that he was going to schedule a, a 9 a.m. hearing in, in the courtroom and that, uh, that uh, Mancusi, who was the warden of the prison, uh, had to be there uh, at, the, at that hearing or he would be put in prison if he weren't there at 10 o'clock. So I went back and walked back up on the steps where these two big goons were and uh, they were kind of shocked that I was back and knocked on the door and I told them when they opened the window that Mancuso had to be at the, uh, at the federal courthouse at 10 o'clock, and there was going to be a hearing on this, and he was going to be held in contempt, uh, and that he better let us in. They slammed the, the door closed, but what happened is as dawn fell, it turned out the New York State coroner officially changed his official New York State coroner's report and acknowledged that all 41 of the hostages had been killed by double buckshot, which meant that they'd been killed by the New York State Police. They were firing down into the yard uh, against all of the inmates and had killed all the hostages. So that is all a story about the Fourth Amendment uh, and the right to a warrant. Uh, that when, when Gene Scheinman knew enough to say that you can't come into this vehicle uh, unless you have a warrant, and the effect that it had on the police at the time is uh, all speaks on behalf of the power that the Constitution has, even in the most dramatic circumstances. You know, it, because the state, the state uh, runs on kind of fascist adrenaline. 
you know, and that they're always in a state where they believe that it's absolutely essential that they get to do whatever it is they want to do. Uh, it just comes with the territory. It's their nature that they believe that they're authorized to do these things. And what they do, not completely irrationally, is they stay focused on the fact that they're determined that the person that they're after has committed a crime. Now, that crime can range from anything uh, that ranges from, you know, uh, driving while black uh, to potentially uh, first degree running uh, if, you, if you live in Baltimore, uh, or direct eye contact with a law enforcement officer, uh, all the way to first degree murder, hot pursuit. You know, that they've seen somebody commit a murder and they're rushing off into their house and uh, they believe they're in hot pursuit and they've got to go in and they aren't going to stop to get a warrant, etc. Uh, so there's a, there's a huge spectrum of conduct that, uh, that, are, that, are, that is covered by this, this set of rules. But the thing to remember is that the, the police always function as authoritarians. The, the type of people who become police officers, the type of people who become district attorneys, the type of people that usually work as lawyers for the state, whether it's the state or the federal government, they think just like authoritarians. You know, because their job is to prosecute. Their job is to punish crime. Their job is to stop crime, okay? And so they view, they view the constitutional rights that we're talking about in this class simply as impediments. They're simply impediments that are being put in their way to keep them from doing their job. And from an operational point of view, totally devoid of any kind of philosophical or metaphysical instincts, which I can assure you they are totally devoid of, you know, that uh, they don't even quite get what the issue is. That they only sense if, there's, if they could get in trouble. You know, if they could get in trouble, such as the law enforcement officers are in trouble now uh, in Baltimore, and like the police officer that killed the young man in, uh, in uh, uh, South Carolina, uh, you know, and then threw the taser down next to it you know, two weeks ago. You know, that these people are in trouble now. And so it's going to start registering with the police officers that, oh, I can get in trouble here. Okay? Our job is to cause trouble for those people. You know, our job is to make certain that if they're going to enforce the law, which we do not disagree with them doing, as long as the law is constitutional, that they have to do so by constitutional means. And the Fourth Amendment is one of the primary constitutional rights that in fact is viewed as an obstruction by law enforcement people uh, and is one of the most important safeguards that we have as citizens against their arbitrary and capricious conduct. And so that, you know, we could study one case after another of these things, but those are the operational principles. And they, they start out with the authoritarian position that was articulated by the king uh, in Europe and in England, in which they asserted that the king's men had a right to go into your house looking for anything they felt like looking for, any time they chose to do it. And of course, their immediate response was that if you didn't agree to let them come into your house, what is it that you're hiding? What is it that you're doing that you don't want them to be allowed into your house? And you can assert to them that, look it, I'm not hiding anything, and, but I don't want you in my house. And, uh, and they take that as a simple confession that you're hiding something from an operational point of view because they happen to believe that, that anybody who is bold enough to assert her or his constitutional rights has to be doing so because they're hiding something. And that's just the way they are. And so you, know, you don't want to spend an awful lot of your time wasting your time trying to convince them of the contrary. 
You just simply tell them you cannot come in. You know, now, in 51% of the cases, that's going to earn you a gun butt, uh, you know, uh, or, a, or, a, or a nightstick, or climbing over the top of you, uh, followed up by a lie on their part in any preliminary hearing that you gave them permission to come in. And that they just happened to have tripped over you accidentally. Uh, this caused all of those injuries that you have. Uh, but I don't let that deter you. Uh, because now you have cell phones and you can turn them on. You know, the minute, the, the minute that you start to have any type of an encounter with a law enforcement official, you know, at home or out in the streets anywhere, you turn on the, the video recorder and you start recording it, which may well and usually will earn the yanking the phone away from you and they're smashing it. You know, but then you can produce the smashed telephone uh, at, the, uh, at the preliminary hearing to suggest that you know this was not the condition of your phone before they arrived, and so that that, that that's what one of the things that you can do right now. But the the most important safeguard that you have is you know asserting your right not to have them come into your private area unless they have a warrant. Okay. And, uh, and so, so what, what I want to do is we, we start out with the, with the simple language of the, of, the st of the constitutional amendment that says that people shall be secure in our persons, homes, p uh, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure, and it will not be violated, and no warrant shall issue except upon the showing of probable cause. Now, what that means is probable cause to believe that a crime has been committed already. Not that there may be a crime, that you may be thinking about committing a crime, that someone rumored that you might be going to commit a crime. There has to be probable cause to believe that a crime has already been committed. And that is a, and they have to be describing in the warrant. Now all of that doesn't justify their coming into your home. All that justifies is a warrant issuing by a magistrate. And the, the entire thrust of this constitutional amendment is to interpose a magistrate between the civilian and the law enforcement officer of the executive branch. That the, the, the bottom line is, and you'll hear it said in some of the cases, Justice Douglas says it, uh, Justice Brennan, William Brennan says it, uh, but oft times, most times, in dissent against the opinion of the majority of the court, stating that what this means, what the Fourth Amendment means, is that, that, no, that any search is unreasonable unless it has been preceded by the issuance of a warrant by an impartial judicial magistrate. Because the police cannot be trusted to be objective about the conditions and about the degree of probability that they have, uh, or at least they're justified by any reasonable inference to have, uh, as to whether or not a crime has been committed and as to whether or not there's any person or thing in that area that would provide evidence to support that. Okay, so that the entire assumption of the Fourth Amendment is that the law enforcement officer cannot be trusted and must not be trusted. Now, the fact that they assume that a, that a judicial magistrate can be trusted may be subject to some question. Uh, but the fact of the matter is they're at least more impartial than the law enforcement officer. And so that... The bottom line that Justice Douglas would take, William Douglas and Justice Brennan, William Brennan, that they would take uh, is, is the position that unless a warrant has been issued by an impartial judicial magistrate, any search that's undertaken is by definition unreasonable. Okay? And so now what, what I want, what I, but what, what happens is that uh, the cases that arise under this, now, they, they would have initially ar arisen, of course, directly under the Fourth Amendment, 
only against the new created federal government because the Fourth Amendment applies only to the federal government that was being created by that document. And we'll, we'll go into uh, on Thursday how it is that the Fourth Amendment came to be applied against the states through the 14th Amendment that was passed after the Civil War, which brought about a dramatic change uh, in the constitutional dynamic in the country, imposing these enumerated rights against the states. Okay, that you had a question. Uh, the ACLU just came out with an app for like phones. Came out with what? An app for phones. Yes. Well, that's cool. A good app. Everybody get that app. You know, the, the, the school will cover that cost for you, I'm sure. Well, I better check with them probably before, before we do that. Yes, Tom, you were going to ask a question. The what? In terms of vehicles, because I know oh, yeah. if they can see something. No, no, we're, we're going we're gonna to get to that. That, uh, that what, what, I wanna, what I want to do is I want to point out that the, the cases, case after case after case after case, that got decided about the Fourth Amendment, there were almost no cases that arose between 1791, when the Fourth Amendment was ratified, between then all the way uh, up to the 1960s. Because, because the federal government wasn't the one that was usually engaged in these kind of searches, uh, that it was usually the state officials. In fact, uh, state officials used to do the job for the feds. They would go in and get whatever it is that they were looking for, and then they would turn it over to the feds. Uh, and then the feds could go, aha, uh, we didn't do it. The states did it. And since the, the Fourth Amendment is not enforceable against the states, uh, we're clean. And they got away with that for a spell, uh, all the way until 1961, in a case called Map versus Ohio, uh, which we'll talk about uh, when we get to the, the due process clause. Uh, but, but the bottom line is, is that when a series of uh, Supreme Court cases started being decided under the Fourth Amendment, uh, one case after another, they ended up looking to a law review article that had been written by the law review at Harvard University, at the law school, by Louis Brandeis back in 1890. That he, had, he had written a, uh, a law review article for the Harvard Law Review called The Right to Privacy. And... Uh, We've posted this. Uh, we've posted this already, haven't we, Toby? Yeah. So you you have this, and I'd I'd like you to just I'd like you to read this law review article uh, for Thursday, so that you'll be prepared to discuss it uh, in in the discussion session. This is the this is the the longer of the pieces. This is the seventeen pager. Okay. The other ones are three pages and nine pages, uh, but, but this is the one because this, this is considered to be probably the most important, most influential law review article ever written because it ended up being cited repeatedly by the United States Supreme Court in support of the more general idea that not only were you protected against police officers coming into your home without a warrant, searching for whatever it is they're looking for, but that in fact, this, these series of cases that were decided one by one, recognizing that right, gave rise to, gave rise to what, they, what they called a penumbra, a penumbra around the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and a penumbra, for those of you who, who may not be familiar with it, it's, it's the concept of a, of a, uh, of a uh, heavenly body, uh, a moon or a, a star that gives off a kind of a halo of light around it. It's a, it's a penumbra of light around the, uh, the body itself. So it's, it's not, it's not the, the direct energized uh, light, it's a penumbra around it. And so that, that uh, this is a term that was adopted by Louis Brandeis in this particular article 
and it began to be cited by Supreme Court justices who were in favor of protecting the reasonable inferences that were generated by the Fourth Amendment in the principle that underlay the Fourth Amendment. So it becomes very important because this idea that the Supreme Court justices were willing to recognize something other than just the most narrow, literal reading of the Fourth Amendment to actually begin to suggest that there was a penumbra generated uh, as a matter of principle or a philosophy around the Fourth Amendment becomes extremely important because that process of recognizing that there was an underlying philosophical principle operating that was codified by this amendment uh, was extremely important with regard to other amendments. Uh, for example, in the First Amendment that we covered uh, last week, you know, that there's nowhere where it says anything about freedom of expression or freedom of thought or freedom of belief. It doesn't say that in the First Amendment. Uh, what it says is that Congress shall pass no law uh, restricting freedom of speech or freedom of religion. You know? but, but if you if you have any kind of an honest understanding of what the philosophy is behind those particular provisions, you will understand that there's a, there's a principle that's operative here. And that's what becomes necessary to understand the spirit of the Constitution and the spirit of these particular individual rights. And this is one of the articles in 1890, you know, which is basically 100 years a hundred years after the, uh, the ratification of the Fourth Amendment in 1791, in, so in 1890, you have a law review article at Harvard written by a future United States Supreme Court justice while he's still in law school, writing this article, saying, this is what it looks like to me. Okay? And now, this, this particular uh, Fourth Amendment was actually drafted by James Madison and, and proposed for the Constitution. And so there, there are three questions that are basically generated by the Fourth Amendment uh, in the language that I've re recited to you. The first one is exactly what type of government conduct constitutes a search or seizure? What, th those are the operative uh, verbs that are uh, nouns in this case. Uh, uh, that what, what, what constitutes a, a search or a seizure? Uh, the second question that gets generated is, what is it that is necessary to establish probable cause? I've already pointed out to you that, that one of the principal aspects of probable cause is that it's probable cause to believe that a crime has already been committed. That's, a, that's an intrinsic concept of probable cause. But what else, what else is operative uh, in, within that concept of probable cause? And uh, a third aspect of the long parade of cases that have been decided with regard to the Fourth Amendment is what is it that the courts can do to try to make sure that the executive branch law enforcement officers obey the Fourth Amendment? and recognize the rights of privacy. Uh, if they just flagrantly disregard the required requirement for warrants, what do you do to them? You know, uh, the, court, the, the courts don't have authority to arrest them. Uh, if, they don't, if they don't lie when they come to court, they can't convict them of contempt of court. Uh, so what, what can they do about this? And th what they've done is they've developed a concept that is called the exclusionary rule. And it's, uh, it's a major uh, controversial aspect of constitutional law. And that is that the, the Supreme Court declared that if, in fact, a law enforcement officer has violated the Fourth Amendment and has undertaken an unreasonable search and or seizure uh, without a warrant, that, in fact, the evidence that was secured by that search and seizure will, in fact, be excluded from evidence in a trial. 
and uh, and there there are important decisions that have been rendered by the courts, and the Supreme Court has talked about this at length because the idea of excluding a particular piece of evidence obviously cuts against a jury being able to know that the evidence exists and cuts against the ability of a prosecuting attorney to get someone convicted for a crime which they in fact committed. And so you say to yourself, well, gee, you know, that, that seems to be kind of a bizarre and costly way of, of protecting the Fourth Amendment. But the, 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 based on all the years of analysis of this, they, they came to the understanding that if you didn't do that, there was no real deterrent uh, that could be enforced by a court. Uh, and, and so that this, this uh, exclusionary rule was developed uh, as early as 1914 in the case of Weeks versus the United States. And uh, so this is the, but the next concept that I want to share with you is the fact is that the, the reactionaries, the reactionaries in the face of these decisions that are being made uh, by the adherence to the natural law worldview, the sixth paradigm natural law uh, worldview adherence, that when they were making these, these, this case law to protect the Fourth Amendment rights, the reactionaries were trying to carve out whole categories of exceptions to the warrant requirement. Because the warrant requirement is the operational uh, lever of the Fourth Amendment. You know, so, that, that's, so they're trying to figure out exceptions to that. And so there's a whole half a dozen of these that they have successfully uh, grafted onto the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the first one is consensual searches. This is that, gee, if somebody says, sure, come on in, officer, you can search my house, you know. Uh, now, the, uh, the, the, that's, going to, that's going to be an exception. They don't need to have a warrant if the person has invited them to come into their house to search. Now you have to ask yourself, uh, given the exclusionary rule, what are the kind of cases that are likely to be coming before the court to try to enforce that Fourth Amendment right? They would almost certainly have to be cases in which something was found that they're trying to get excluded to protect their Fourth Amendment right. And so that you have to ask yourself, why would someone who has something in their house, which if found by the police, are going to result in their being criminally prosecuted, invite the police to come in to search for it? Uh, on the face of it, it doesn't make much sense. Unless the people have been coerced in some way. That they've been intimidated in some way. And so, so that uh, the, the, the entire area of attempting to carve out a categorical exception to the warrant requirement by the reactionaries that let's in fact have a whole category of consented to, consented to searches despite the facial irrationality of that because they don't care. The reactionaries don't care because what they'd like to do is they'd like to get all the way back if they could to the authoritarian position on this. So they're going to be attempting to carve into the natural law right of privacy or Fourth Amendment right to have a warrant before, their house, before any of your property can be searched. They're going to try to cut away at that. And they don't care that on the face of it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Because all they're trying to do is talk to each other and to the authoritarians and see if they can muster adequate coalition force to get away with this. Now, one of the other parties, of course, to whom they're speaking is not to the natural law advocates because they aren't going to listen to this. They know exactly where these people are coming from. Who they're after are the moderates. They're after the moderates. They're trying to get the moderates to go along with them to say, well, yeah, yeah, it's true that if someone did, in fact, invite the police in, to search their home, then certainly the, they don't have to have a warrant because they've been invited in. 
Uh, and that's as far as they go with their analysis. They don't say, well, why would anybody in their right mind do that? You know? Yes? I mean, how would you go about proving you know, consent? Well, that's exactly the point. The way, the way they, the, the question was, how do they go about uh, proving consent? The way they go about proving it is the police officer coming on the stand and saying, he said I could come in. And uh, all of those bruises and, uh, and broken limbs, uh, they just happened to have, I happened to have stumbled over them when I was on the way in the door. And the fact that the door was broken off the hinges, you know, was just because, you know, when I opened the door, it broke. You know, and I mean, we've had, I've had cases like this, the Timbuk Piles case in New York, you know, where they actually broke the entire door off the, in the door jam completely out of the apartment, you know. Uh, and uh, and the, uh, the judge uh, kept insisting he didn't want to have any evidence on the fact that there was no door left on the apartment uh, because he also was a right-wing reactionary in that particular case, which a lot of the criminal judges happen to be because they're former district attorneys who are made uh, judges in the criminal courts. Tom? Well, that's right. So what can people do who don't have the money to hire a top-notch attorney who only have access to a public defender? What can they do to safeguard their rights? Mostly take the videos. And now you take the videos of them. The minute they're, you, they're anywhere near the place, turn on the videos of your camera and video the whole thing. And uh, the, the, fortunately, if there's an app that the ACLU is now making available that it'll go right straight to, to them, you ought to do that. Find, get, find out what that app is and, and get it. Um, Sarah. Do state or federal officials have the authority to arrest you if you refuse to comply with their orders? Like, if they tell you you can't come in, are they allowed to come in? Yeah. No, no, they, they, they don't have the authority to arrest you for refusing to consent to the search. Th that's true. The problem is is that they will virtually always take your refusal to consent as additional evidence of your guilt, of whatever it is that's brought them to where they are then. And, and it's, it sounds absurd on the face of it. And if you get to examine them during the probable cause hearing, uh, which many magistrates won't allow you to do, uh, that you could demonstrate to the magistrate that this is totally irrational. That, it's, that no one in their rational mind could believe what it is they're saying. The problem is that a probable cause hearing, an arraignment, they don't allow you to cross-examine the, the prosecutor's uh, witnesses, which is the, is the police officer always. And they lie all the time. They just lie all the time. And nobody does anything to them at all because the people who would do something to them are the prosecutors. And they're lying on behalf of the prosecutor's cases. So that's the way it. That's the way they do it. Um, I, I just have two questions. One of them is a follow-up. But um, if you're if you're caught speeding in the car over the speeding limit, so you did break the law, and they pull you over, and then there's no uh, probable cause, do they have the right to search your car because of the past crime of speeding? This this is this is the other one of the other exceptions, which is the the uh, search of vehicles, the motor vehicle search. This is another completely irrational exception that the reactionaries have gotten away with, that they've carved into the right of privacy to saying that if in fact you're stopped for a speeding ticket, that the police now, and what they do is they, they take the concepts that have been crafted by the moderates, by the middle marginalists, and then they expand them if they can. And they got the middle marginalists to agree that if a police officer has stopped you in a vehicle uh, and he has reason to believe that you may be armed, that they have a right to search the area that is immediately within the reach of you in the car to search for a firearm, okay? And so what they do is they, they use that as the lever for, for saying that they wanna search your car. You know, and, and if they say step out of your vehicle, your response is no thank you, no thank you. I don't, I don't intend to step out of the vehicle, I'm not coming out of the vehicle. At which point they say, oh yeah, how would you like to be arrested for possession of marijuana? 
You know, that's what they, and, and they go through this whole routine of attempting to coerce you. Uh, you know, and so, so this, this goes on all the time. Uh, so what, what you have to do is you have to stand your ground. You have to stand your ground and record it so that you have indisputable evidence that because they will lie and simply say that instead of you saying absolutely not, you said, yes, please come into my car. You know, I need to have you take a look around. It makes me feel better. You know, and, 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 they, and they say these ridiculous things. Uh, and the judges all sit there and nod at them. All these magistrates who are former prosecutors who are on their way to being appointed to be full judges. And uh, to the degree to which they go along with the cops uh, and prosecute people uh, in the magistrate's position, that that's increasing the probability they'll be made a judge. You know, so, the, so what I'm saying is you have to understand this process as an adversarial process. So you've got to be able to confront them. Uh, you know, and I, I don't know if I told you about the case with, uh, with the, the, the young fellow who was, a, who was a, uh, a young guy that lived out on Coney Island in New York. Uh, this is one of the first cases I did as an ACLU lawyer that, uh, you know, he was on his way home on a, on a Saturday night out on Coney Island from his father's home that was three blocks away from where his mother lived. He was walking home, and there were all these police uh, that had uh, been up in this building, and they were on their way out of the building, and he stopped, and there was a crowd of people all gathered around, and he stepped out, and he asked one of the police officers, what's going on around here? And, and the cop turned around and beat the crap out of him, you know, pounded him into the ground and broke his nose and his cheekbone and all this stuff, and, and uh, he ended up calling ACLU and uh, asking to be represented, and as soon as he filed a complaint against, in the, uh, it's, it's called the Police Civilian Review Board. Uh, and it's a police civilian review, but there are no civilians on it. Uh, and it's a, it's a review of civilian complaints against them. And you've heard a lot about this around Ferguson and, and, uh, and Baltimore and stuff about this, this whole ridiculous process they have of not governing the police. In that particular case, uh, because, because, I, because I was uh, in the Cahill firm and right next to me in the office was Mike Armstrong, who was the chief counsel for the Knapp Commission, which was a, a commission appointed to investigate politi uh, police corruption in the city of New York. You've probably never seen the film, but there's, there's a film called Serpico that's uh, Al Pacino plays this uh, detective in New York. It's a real guy uh, who refused to go on the pad, refused to take bribes uh, in the New York City police, and uh, ended up being allowed to be shot by his fellow police officers, hoping he'd be killed because they thought he was going to testify against them in front of the Knapp Commission, uh, which is what inspired him to testify in front of the Knapp Commissions once he was shot. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and it turns out that uh, Serpico used to come into our office all the time to be, to be prepared for his testimony by Mike Armstrong. So Mike was in the next office to me. And so what I did is uh, when I got this case, you know, I, I asked Mike, I said, uh, would, uh, would you uh, call over to the 15th precinct over in Brooklyn, where this is out in Coney Island, and tell them that one of your associates is coming out to want to review the interviews uh, of this policeman's partners. Uh, and so he did. And so I went out there and I introduced myself as an associate of Mike Armstrong, which I was in the Cahill firm. And they all assumed that I was from the Knapp Commission. And so I got to listen to the tape recordings of the other officers who were there on the scene and one of them was his, his car partner's uh, interview where he talks at length about how the guy just exploded on this poor kid who just walked up and asked him what was going on, gave a full detailed description of it. So, but when I, when I arrived at the, uh, at the Brooklyn Police Department to listen to this, they said, yeah, but you can't, you can't take any notes on this. You know? And so what I did is I went in and they brought the tapes in, and I, they brought a little machine in and I put the the, the tape on and I just opened up my briefcase and turned on the tape recorder that I had. And so I retaped the, the interview. And so when we, we go to the trial and we seat the jury and the cop gets on the stand and of course he gets up and lies like a rug. 
you know, and it gets up there and just says, you know, I was, uh, you know, this, I was uh, standing there doing my job, and we'd, re we'd, uh, we'd responded to an officer down uh, call, an emergency call from a fellow officer that he'd been shot and was in, uh, in mortal danger, and that we had come to the scene, and we were there busily trying to find him, and this guy comes up to me and jumps on me and tries to take my weapon away, uh, and so I had to defend myself. You know, you're just, you're ready to puke, you know, listening to this guy. And here's, here's the jury all sitting there out in Brooklyn going, hmm, mm, and listening to him. So he gets done with his direct testimony. And so I got up and I said to him, I said, officer, I said, no, uh, I, just wanna, I just want to advise you that you're under oath here and want to make it clear to the jury that if you are committing perjury about what you're saying here, that uh, you will, in fact, be criminally prosecuted for this. And Judge uh, Fury, who was the judge, starts pounding his gavel. And he says, I don't want to have any of that in this courtroom, Mr. Sheehan. He said, you know, you don't have to lecture them. You're not on television now. He said, uh, he says, so just go ahead and ask him your questions. And so I said, uh, okay. I said, look, I'm going to play a, a, a tape recording for you, and I want you to listen to it closely. And if there comes a point in time where this refreshes your recollection as to exactly what happened, uh, you can stop me any time. So I punched the button before the judge could stop me, and it starts playing out in the courtroom. And, and he recognizes his partner, so he's not worried because he, he thinks his partner isn't going to turn him in, right? And we get about two and a half minutes into this tape, and it's perfectly clear that the guy is you know, throwing him totally under the bus. Uh, and the jury's all going, whoa, whoa, they're listening to this, right? And the judge starts realizing what's happening. You know, he wakes up out of his stupor, and he goes, uh, whoa, wait a second. He, says, he starts pounding his gap. Turn that off. Turn that off. He says, where did you get that? I said, look, it doesn't make any difference where I got it. I said, you know, I'm just asking him if it refreshes his recollection. And the judge says, Mr. Sheehan, he said, you're attempting to impugn the integrity of a law enforcement officer of the city of New York. And I said, yes, and I thought I was doing a pretty damn good job of it, too, Your Honor. And the ju jury all starts laughing. Uh, and, uh, and he says, uh, I'm not going to stand for that in this courtroom. He said, uh, these law enforcement officers are in danger every day. Uh, he said, and uh, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna stop this right now, right now. I said, and I said, yeah, but the fact is he's lying, uh, and now the jury knows he's lying. And the judge says, I'm not going to have you drawing any inferences from whatever it is that they've heard already. Uh, and I said, fine. And he said, okay, Mr. Sheehan. He says, uh, and I want the jury taken out of this room. And they moved the jury out, and he says, Mr. Sheehan, he said, uh, uh, I know what you're doing here. You're just here trying to get this guy off what he said to me. I said, well, actually, Your Honor, I said, I'm here on behalf of the American Civil Liberties Union, uh, and I'm doing this entirely for free, and I'm representing him because of the police brutality that's involved. He says, he says, don't you try to intimidate me by telling me where you come from. He said, I've been a judge for 25 years. And I said, well, Your Honor, if you've been a judge for 25 years and you don't know any more about the law than you seem to, I'm certainly not intimidated. And there was this big dead silence fell over the room and all 50 police officers who were the only people in the audience that had come to listen to this case. And there was this big deathly silence. And he glowered down and he says, Mr. Sheehan, he said, we're going to deal with this. He said, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to deal with this, he said, after this case is over. I said, you know, after the case is over, before the case is over, it doesn't make a difference to me because it looks to me like the case is over already. You know? <laughs> and so the jury acquitted him. And they didn't do shit. You know, the judge just tries to intimidate you. That's all that they try to do. So I went over and I said to, I said to the court stenographer, I said, I'd like to get a copy of this transcript, please, of his, his sworn testimony and a transcription of the tape that was played. Uh, and I, I took the, I took the, copy of the co other copy of the tape that I had, and I marched right straight upstairs to the district attorney's office. And I went upstairs, and I walked into the district attorney's office, and the secretary's going, no, wait, 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 you can't go in there. And I walked right into the district attorney, and I laid the tape down in front of him. And I said, there's a, there's a transcript coming of the, prelim the trial that's just been held. I said, and I want you to review that, and I want this guy prosecuted for perjury. And he looked at me, he leaned back and looked at me, and he pointed like this over his shoulder. And up on the wall, over his desk in the district attorney's office, was this great big huge circle with gold around the edges of it in blue background with big gold letters saying, Cops are tops. <laughs> and he says, look, I got to work with these guys every day, he said. You know, and wouldn't do a thing. Wouldn't do a thing. 
So what I'm saying to you is that you, you've got to understand that the people that are involved on the law enforcement side, you know, are, are, are basically, they have their blood up, you know, looking after stopping crime. They spend their entire lives together talking about criminals and, in fact, dealing with criminals, real criminals. Uh, and the problem is, is that they view all of us as presumed criminals until we prove differently. And if we aren't willing to take the steps of allowing them into the house to search without a warrant uh, in telling them everything that you've done over the last year of your life, if they want to know, in telling everything you know about every neighbor that you, or friend that you have, if you don't do that, they're going to view you as being the enemy. And so you need to understand that. Okay, so in the upcoming crisis that we're going to be talking about in the third part of the course, you have to realize that when you're dealing with police officers, uh, law enforcement people, FBI people, uh, National Guard people, all of them are in this high state of adrenaline and they believe that you're the enemy and so that you have to know that. And so you have to be absolutely scrupulous about maintaining these constitutional rights and asserting them and evidencing them you know every step of the way and if you start doing that you can actually succeed as we did at the night of the Attica prison murders you know backing the police down and actually getting to get it to the prison you might not get in but we stopped them from they were they were going to prosecute all of those inmates uh, for first-degree murder and try to put them in the electric chair Whereas they did not, in fact, kill those, those hostages. The police killed them. And they were going to try to execute these other people for having done it. So you've you, so you got to understand that that's, that's what's going on here. So the, now the, the motor vehicle, we've covered the motor vehicle search where they, they argue that it's, it's incident to a lawful stop. Now, you've got to remember, for all of those of us who cared anything about that stupid test they give you to renew your license, you know, that that you are, number one, when you get your driver's license in the state of California, you've already consented to, as a condition for getting your driver's license, allowing them to give you a breathalyzer any time, any place that you're driving, that they can stop you at any time. Now, under the Supreme Court rulings, they don't have to have any probable cause. They don't have to make up this bullshit about you had a faulty taillight. That's what they used to do. You know, they would come and they would kick your taillight out uh, on the way to the front window, and then say you have a faulty tail light, uh, you know, and you're intimidated because you know they just kicked your tail light out, you know, so you can know that they're they're up to something, and so the, the the bottom line is now that the Supreme Court doesn't even require them to do that, they can stop you anytime, any place, and do and perform one of these uh, these breathalyzer tests, uh, and your simple refusal to take the breathalyzer causes your license to be suspended automatically for a year. Okay, so that you can see that these, these kind of forces of reaction uh, moving back toward the authoritarian model uh, of individual liberties is very much underway now. And it's going to be generating the crisis, part of the crisis that we're going to be talking about in part three with this repressive court that we have with, with you know, four dyed-in-the-wool reactionaries, uh, one conservative, Justice Kennedy, and uh, four moderates. You know, with no members of the progressive community on it, much less any utopianist. You know, so it's all weighted toward the right side of the a political spectrum. Yes. Um, I actually heard that was not true. I heard that. The what? Uh, I heard that wasn't true. That you didn't have to take breathalyzer until you actually at the station. No, that's not true. They they, they tell you that, that if they've got a breathalyzer with them, and they tell you that they want you to take the breathalyzer test. You either agree to take it if they choose to administer it there on the scene. If you don't agree to take it, what they're thinking you're doing is you're stalling because you want to make them bring you all the way to the station so that your alcohol level will have gone down by the time you get there. Exactly. That's a, you know, you no, no, you don't. No, you don't. And be clear about that. When they say, here, I've got the breathalyzer, you take the breathalyzer now. If you decline to take it right then, that's it. And they check off on the ticket that you refuse to take the breathalyzer test and you're done for. And there's not a court in the state that's going to reverse that. Can you request a blood test though? You can request a blood test. Yes, you can. 
uh, you can request a blood test. And in that particular case, usually they aren't prepared to give you the blood test in the field. They tend to have to bring you to the, to the station. Okay? But on the other hand, the blood test is much more accurate. <laughs> so if, you're, uh, if you, you think there's a possibility of you blowing only a .07, you know, you better do it, you know. Or you can always go, <laughs> that's it, you know. Or you could have the person in the car do it for you, you know. But, uh, but the, the fact of the matter is, you know, the, the, this is, they've ratcheted down on you in, in big shape now. And, and the fact is that in the new licenses that they're now issuing in California, the next time you go in to renew your driver's license, they're going to have a chip in the license, which is a GPS, where they can track you anytime, any place, anywhere, uh, as long as you have your license on you. Uh, and the fact is, if you don't have your license on you, you can't drive anywhere. Uh, because if they stop you and you don't have your license, they're allowed to take you into custody. Pardon? Yes. But, uh, but, but, the, but the bottom line is you can be sure that most people aren't going to own up to do this. And, that the, so the, the, and now that the, the GPSs that are in the, in the driver's license can be scanned at a distance, which means that uh, you don't even have to be out of the car for these to be scanned. You know? And so that they've got these, they've got these uh, machines along the highway now You'll notice on the, on the new cars that you get and the rental cars that you got, they've got these little uh, bar, bar things, the little barcodes on the window, and they pick, up, they pick it up as you drive by on the highways now. They've got these little barcodes, and they register where your car is, and they register you know, now from the, the GPS things that you have on your, in your phone. Your phone has this GPS in it, and even if you... Even if you aren't using the GPS, it registers where you are. And there, it turns out that the companies are keeping track of where you are and how long you spend there, how often you go to the same address, how much time you spend at that address at any given time. They store all of that. And it's now accessible by the government. Okay? So you need to know that. I mean, you ought to get rid of that GPS and read a map. You know? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Isn't that like they're constantly serving you with no warrant? Like, yeah, that? yeah. And, and that's another one of the exceptions. See how your instincts are? The uh, national security. This whole thing of national security, uh, foreign intelligence surveillance. That this is another full categorical exception that they make to the warrant requirement. What they say, what they say now is that they're allowed to engage in an ongoing general search. Uh, of your of your cell phone uh, calls, your your uh, emails, your uh, Google checks that you do, all of that they're monitoring. And the, the position that, that the Obama administration is taking is that look, we're not doing that. The companies are doing that. Okay. And the fact is that the companies are doing that because the government told them to do it, and so they've consented to doing it. Because if they don't consent to doing it, the government will not give them a license, you see. So they condition the giving of their license to them on you, uh, on them agreeing to that, this. And not only that, they have to, they've got this order that when they're ordered to do it and they do it, they can't tell anybody they're doing it. Because they've got these gag order uh, letters that are prohibiting them that they can be actually sentenced to prison if they tell anybody that in fact they're gathering the data and giving it to the federal government. Where are you getting this stuff about the Where am I getting this? Yeah, I the, all, all you have to do is check it out. You can check anywhere. You can check it on Google anywhere. You can find it. That they're putting their, their, they've gotten authorization now to put the GPS thing in the licenses and that they're monitored all the time. And, and the fact of the matter is, it's also got your other data on it. It's got more data than just the GPS. It's got your identification data. Okay? So it has all your police records. Uh, and th there's some question about how much they're going to be allowed to put in there. But it's, as of right now, it's identification data that they're allowed to put in there, as well as your, as well as your location. 
So we, we've, we've covered a few of these. They've got the consensual searches. They've got the motor vehicle searches. They've got the, uh, the uh, federal intelligence, uh, foreign intelligence surveillance. And then they've got another set of them that had to do with, I've mentioned to you, the alleged self-protection of the officer. That if the officer, they, they've ruled now the reactionaries being in charge of these decisions in the Supreme Court, along with Kennedy uh, as the conservative, that they've now authorized a police officer to come up to you and walk up to you and ask you any questions that they want. And the fact of the matter is they are acknowledging that you have a right not to answer the questions. They have a, you have a right to walk away. The problem is that they've now ratified decisions that your walking away and refusing to answer the questions can be taken into consideration on the part of the officer as to whether or not he thinks that there are suspicious circumstances. And, and that you're walking away and refusing to answer their questions is deemed as a factor in determining whether or not there are suspicious circumstances here. Uh, and other suspicious circumstances are the area where you are. You know, if you're in a, quote, high crime area, you heard that that is what was being asserted in Baltimore, <coughs> is that this young fellow, Freddie Gray, was actually in a high crime area and that he made eye contact with the officer, and then he ran away. And that that was considered, it is being argued aggressively by the police department in Baltimore and the, district, the uh, police attorneys, that in fact that constituted authorization for the police to throw him to the ground and manacle him and arrest him, you know, for running away from a police officer. Okay, so that... This, this, whole, this whole issue is what, what they call exigent circumstances, you know, which, which means almost anything they want it to mean. Exigent circumstances uh, authorize them to forego the warrant requirement. Now, they can get the, mar the middle marginalists, these moderates, to go along with acknowledging at least the principle that there could be some circumstances that are exigent that might allow the waiving of a warrant for example, if a person has just gunned down an entire audience in the movie theater and that they're running down, they run out of the theater and you have all of the people saying, that's the guy, that's the guy, and you follow him out of the movie theater and he runs into a, a house and uh, you come to the door uh, and uh, he says you can't come in. You know? And so therefore you're supposed to do what? You're supposed to go get a search warrant. And they say, well, no, uh, under those exigent circumstances, you could probably go in and pursue him because he's endangering other people's lives. And he's already displayed the ability and willingness to kill people. And so in order to save the lives, you can go in without a search warrant. And the minute that you give them that principle, they start carving away at it and expanding it out uh, because that's what they want. Remember, they're trying to pull back to the position of the authoritarians. The reactionaries are always trying to get back to that place. And so what you have, you have cases, you have cases like, for example, in uh, Cleveland, Ohio, where they had the, uh, where the police, the police, uh, really interesting case that there was a, there were a bunch of bookies that were betting on the, on the fights. Uh, and that one of the guys who was a bookie, they suspected they'd gotten an anonymous tip that this bookie is one of the guys that, uh, blew up the house, uh, uh, anyway, the porch on the house of Don King, who was one of the major fight promoters, uh, and uh, blew up his house, and that they were looking for this guy, and they got an anonymous tip that he was at a such and such a house. And so they go to the house, and that they, uh, they go to the house, and uh, they come up to the door, and they said they smelled marijuana, right? Uh, and, uh, and so what they did is they banged on the door, pounded on the door, and demanded to be let in, and the people inside wouldn't agree to let them in. So they broke the door down and they went in uh, and they didn't find the guy they were looking for. Uh, and not only that, but they didn't find any marijuana. Uh, and, but what they did find is in the drawer near the bed, they found two magazines that they viewed to be as pornographic. And so what they did is they ended up prosecuting the people for possession of pornography. Uh, and that they said that they had searched in the drawers because they were looking to see if they had any guns because they had to protect themselves since they were authorized now to be in the, according to them, inside the room. Uh, and so that, in that, that decision was upheld by the Supreme Court. 
uh, because it was exigent circumstances that uh, they, they, the people started rummaging around inside the, inside, the, inside the apartment after they pounded on the door and said it was the police. And they said they had, they interpreted that as they were destroying the evidence. And when you ask them, like, evidence of what? They said it must be evidence of the marijuana because that's what it caused them to have, they thought, the right to search the apartment. Uh, and so that them ruff, ruffling around uh, was interpreted reasonably as possibly destroying the evidence. And so therefore, they were, they were authorized to break the door down and go into their apartment. And when they found the other stuff in, quote, plain view, that they found because they were searching for weapons to protect themselves, incident to a lawful arrest, and uh, they allowed all that evidence in. And so that what you can see is that, that any type of rational, responsible positions of principle that could be articulated by the natural law advocates uh, are being carved away at by the reactionaries attempting to get back to the authoritarian position and they're doing so by reaching out and persuading the moderates to acknowledge some extreme case in which they might, as a matter of principle, allow a search without a warrant. And once they get that, that exception, they start expanding it in every way that they possibly can, trying to cite that authorization, that that's how this process goes. Yes, Sophia. Okay, so I was just wondering, oh man, I almost, now, are, so are you suggesting in particular, because you were talking about the whole shooting up a movie theater thing, are you suggesting that any of these recent events with shootings have been test cases, or is it just coincidental that you mentioned that? Test cases, no. No, I'm just, I'm just pointing out, I was choosing that as an example that might be argued as to a situation in which you might reasonably agree that the police have the right to pursue that person into a house where the person has fled to uh, without having to go through the whole process of getting a search warrant because of the potential threat to life that that person represents and that he's inside someone's house. He could be threatening them or taking hostages if you delay. And so all I'm saying is that that is, I'm giving an example of what you might conceive of as being an exigent circumstance. In, in, okay, in, in, which, in which you might agree, you might agree that it wasn't absolutely necessary for them to go get a warrant at that particular, at that particular instance. Okay? So that, uh, Tom, you had a question. Oh yeah, no, you can try anything you want, you know. Really, <laughs> you can say, uh, uh, "No," but but actually, uh, if you cite a case or two to them, it gets their attention because they say, "Uh oh," you know, this person knows what they're talking about. They've apparently been reading books or taking Danny's class, uh, uh, and that uh, who knows, he may show up uh, any time here. Uh, you know, so, so that uh, there, there are some things that you can say. I've never found it to be particularly effective unless, unless uh, you're a lawyer. And uh, I'll just tell you one other thing before we go to the questions is that when I was, uh, this must have been 1979 or so, uh, and I was, uh, I was on the way out of town in Washington. I was at the Jesuit National Headquarters, uh, and uh, I was chairing the national uh, task force on civil rights and criminal justice for the uh, the the national uh, uh, inter internet the Washington Interreligious Staff Council that the the Washington D.C. staffs of all 54 of the major denominations in the United States and in that context uh, I, in chairing that that committee we had ACLU people on there in the National Emergency uh, Committee for Civil Rights and others. And there was this group came that was called the, uh, the Human Rights Commission. And uh, it took me all of three minutes to figure out that they were Scientologists. 
And uh, so there were some Scientologists there. And I didn't mind. I knew the Scientologists had been doing lots of work on issues of uh, individual liberties and stuff like that. And so I, I was, they viewed me as being open to listening to them. And so I was on the way out of town this one Friday morning, and I stopped to just check before I left town if there's anything up at the office. And Father Bill Davis told me that there were all these emergency phone calls coming in for me, uh, that the FBI had just descended on the national headquarters uh, of the Church of Scientology uh, in Washington, D.C. And they were screaming, wanting me to get over there as fast as I could. So I drove over to the place and I show up and here are these two big mass arrest vehicles, you know, with the big, uh, big uh, uh, satellite dishes on the top of them. And, and uh, there must have been 50 FBI agents all over the place. And they had gone into the building. They had chainsawed the doors off. They had chainsawed the doors off the, uh, the headquarters. Turns out that they had chainsawed off the doors of the headquarters in California at the same time. at 6 a.m., 9 a.m. they hit this place. And that they were inside with Xerox machines. And they were Xeroxing every single document in the building. And so uh, I, I found the chief guardian. And, and I said, look, who's, uh, who's in charge here of this thing? And he pointed me to one of the FBI guys and his big, his big uh, rain slicker. So I go over to him and I, I say, look, I want to see the warrant. I said, you know, I'm Dan Sheehan, I'm chief counsel uh, for the Jesuit National Headquarters, and uh, I chair the, the Committee on uh, Civil Rights and Constitutional Rights uh, for the National Council of Churches people, and I want to see this warrant. And so he shows me the warrant, and what it did is it, it was authorized. The, the, what had triggered this whole thing is that, you may have heard about it, the Church of Scientology was in this kind of pitch battle with the IRS because the IRS was trying to insist that they were not a legitimate church and they were trying to revoke their, their status as a church so they didn't have tax exemption. And, uh, and so they were this, in this high contest with each other. And it turns out the IRS building has, an, has a room downstairs in the IRS building which is completely soundproofed with uh, these asbestos walls and the big plunger door that they have on it. And it turns out that uh, they have their most secret conferences in this room. And what they discovered was that in the conference table, they discovered an electronic bug that was in their table, that had been built into their table. And they immediately determined that this had to be the Church of Scientology that had put this here, because that was the most sensitive case they had in the office. And so what they did is they, issued, they got this warrant issued to go search the, the headquarters here in, in, or there in Washington and in California, in Los Angeles, for the evidence. Uh, and they, list, they started listing in, listing in the warrant documents indicating that they'd purchased electronic surveillance equipment, uh, documents indicating that they had, uh, had cased out the, uh, the IRS building, uh, any documents indicating they'd ever penetrated the IRS building. And it goes on and on and on with all these details. And then it gets down to the very last paragraph, and it says, and any and all evidence of the commission of any other crime, either state or federal. Now, that constitutes a general warrant. And the general warrant is what it is that had generated the need to have the Fourth Amendment to begin with. Because the British Crown used to be issuing these general writs of assistance, they called them, uh, authorizing the British colonial troops uh, and their IRS people the people that were their, their customs agents, the revenuers, as they were, collecting revenue on all the taxes that were imposed upon the imports coming into the colonies. Uh, and they were allowed to go into anybody's house or offices at any time of the day or night and search for anything that was evidence of them not paying the proper uh, customs taxes. And so that, that, that was exactly what that was. That was a general warrant. And so uh, I got a copy of the warrant and went immediately to Judge Green at the Federal District Court. It took him all of five minutes to issue an order declaring it to be unconstitutional. Uh, I brought it back. I, I, I drafted up the order myself. He signed it, brought it back, ordered them out of all the buildings, ordered them to give back every single thing that they had seized, uh, ordering them to give back every single fingerprint that they had taken off of any surface or any document in the place and ordered them to give the entire thing back. Uh, and, and here they are, I mean, you know, armed to the teeth, and, uh, and with a copy of a court order, you can put it in front of them, and they withdrew and gave back all of the documentation, gave back all the fingerprint evidence that they'd taken, and packed back up and left. 
and we sent it uh, out to California, uh, the copy of the order, and they went in and got a similar order in LA and got the same order out there. So that you can do that. You, you, you can do this still. You know, but the, the, what we're going to discover is that as the crisis deepens uh, and as the, the uh, logical consequences of the massive global climate change begin to occur, you're going to find that the, the fervor with which the present federal authorities are pursuing terrorists uh, is going to start to expand out uh, onto anyone who basically is uh, engaged in, in conversations about what type of radical action needs to be taken to stop the major corporations from doing what it is that they're doing, uh, to killing the planet and, and potentially killing tens of thousands of people uh, that are going to result in being killed because of the consequences of this. Okay. So, so this Fourth Amendment is a, is a very important one, and I would, I would uh, direct your attention to not only that article, but there's a, there's a, a, a cats, there's a cats versus the United States, which is one of the cases I've, I've given to you to suggest that you read for, uh, for Thursday and for the following, uh, following week. All those cases that I've listed out are primarily to be read for Thursday and the following week so that we can discuss these things, right? Uh, and, uh, but there, there are, are um, tons of these cases around, uh, but these are, these are the basic principles that are operative, uh, and uh, these, are, these are the teams, these are the teams that are in the field uh, debating this, that there are the old authoritarians that that were in Europe and England as part of the ecclesial class and the royalist class. They're your reactionaries now that are supported by four of the justices on the Supreme Court, including Justice John Roberts, who's the, the, the Chief Justice. And you know, you've got Scalia and Alito and Justice Thomas are all there. And then you've got, you've got your conservative over here who is Justice Kennedy. And then you've got the moderates. The other ones, Bader Ginsburg and, the, and Kagan and the other ones, are all the moderates. So all you have is a debate going on between the moderates and the reactionaries right now. So the reactionaries are hard pressing to get the moderates to concede general principles to them so they can set up this national security state that they're all working on. Uh, so look, let's, let's uh, uh, I've, I've run right straight through, uh, but if, if there are any other questions that you've got, uh, immediately, uh, I can answer them right now, uh, or make your notes, and we can talk about these on Thursday in the follow-up. But this is our discussion of the Fourth Amendment, and all of the issues. We're going to talk a lot about this in the third part of the course because all this electronic surveillance and the monitoring, monitoring of your computers, and all of that. We're going to go into a lot of detail and read some of those cases uh, that you're going to want to know about. Okay. Okay. Great. I'll, I'll see you on uh, see you on Thursday.